Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second part of this series. It covers the story of a brutal murder of a local Lexington family, and some of the details may be difficult to hear. Listener discretion is advised. Now, once they left that house on Charberry Court, the convicts headed north. And knowing that the police would soon be on the lookout for the stolen car, they invaded a home, a home it was secluded from, from the main road because of trees, and it was like, what, 100, 200 feet from the, or yards from the road, on Russell Cave Road, the Barnes home. And there's been various reports on how they ended up at, at the Barnes home. One... How far? Is it's distance? about a mile and a half. A mile and a half. A mile and a half from that's Charberry a, Court. Yeah, that's a good yeah, distance. Yeah, and apparently they were heading on Russell Cave Road. One speculation was that they were driving down the road and, and saw Francine Barnes, I guess, returning from school and saw her get out of her car and decided to break in. Another report that I've heard about is that it was around the Barnes house that the car of the carjacking victim had run out of gas or was getting ready to run out of gas and they needed a new car. I, I don't know the true story on how they got there. My, my thought would be that they knew that car was hot, mm-hmm. and sooner or later the police were going to be looking for it, and maybe yeah, they thought, they the plate, yeah, maybe they thought, well, let's try to get another car. I don't, I don't know that for a fact. But anyway, they turned off Russell K. Road into the driveway of the Barnes home and parked the car behind the home, and they entered the house, and again, I get conflicting stories about how they got in, how they got in, who was there. According to one report, Francine was there by herself, mm-hmm. and um, the prisoners got in there and broke in, according to a statement by one of the prisoners later, and searched the house, found some guns, mm-hmm. and waited for Mr. Barnes, Reverend Barnes, and his younger child, John, to return from football practice. Like I mentioned, he was on the football team, and mm-hmm. apparently they were coming home from football practice, and John was actually found the next morning wearing his football uniform, number 47. And the home, like I mentioned, was a comfortable home situated about 200 feet off uh, Russell Cave Road, not 200 yards, like I said earlier. And it was about two miles north of New Circle Road. And it was surrounded by trees and fields. Uh, The nearest neighbor was about a quarter of a mile away, and no one in the area heard anything. Now, the Barnes did have some dogs, a couple German Shepherds and maybe a little smaller dog. But some farm hands that were working down the road said they, they didn't hear anything, never they heard any barking, anything. and didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. And as I mentioned before, if only the police at the time had a helicopter. That would have been the area they would have been scanning. Yes. Yeah. And it was open they, they fields would so they have could been see everything. In the yeah. north end of town because the lady that was carjacked was from the north end of town. Unfortunately, we didn't have the helicopters. Now, what happened in that house happened over several hours. They broke in, tied up the family, apparently drank some of the wine that was in the refrigerator. So they held the barns hostage before killing them, and this went on for several hours. The, The horror that went on in that house can't be described in this podcast won't be described in this podcast. I didn't realize it was so long. So I, it wasn't like a quick no. murder and they, they, they kind of took their time. and Since they left the other house, yeah. probably around, what, 4.15 or so, and the Barnes home was a mile and a half away approximately, it would have been a quick drive from that house over to the Barnes house. So they probably got there sometime around 4.30, maybe a few minutes later. And... They didn't leave until at least dark. Yeah. Uh, some reports have them leaving as late as 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. They ended up in Falmouth, which is an hour's drive from Lexington, and they got there at 1 o'clock. So, you know, it could have been later. But they were in that house for several hours, shot all three of them, mm-hmm. sexually assaulted Miss Barnes, dragged them to the bathroom. That's where the bodies were found the following. All three of them? Yes. 
piled on top of each other. So, like I was saying, they probably left the house after dark and drove to Falmouth and around 1 a.m. Is there a reason why they chose Falmouth? Why did they drive over there? Well, it was on Russell K. was is U.S. 27, and U.S. 27 leads to northern Kentucky. And speculation was Scott, who, you know, all reports that I've read, newspaper reports, uh, there was a book put out a few years ago that uh, had a chapter about the murder. And it's pretty apparent from those readings that Scott, the older of the two, was the guy in charge. He was yeah. calling all the shots. Anyway, apparently he wanted to get up to Cincinnati. So they headed north. Sloan was from Louisville, as I mentioned earlier, and maybe they figured, well, they'll be looking for us going to Louisville. So they decided to take US-27 up toward northern Kentucky, and it just so happens that Falmouth is on that route. Now, they arrived approximately 1 a.m. at the Fisher's Motel on US-27 in Falmouth, Kentucky, which is Pendleton County. They pounded on the hotel clerk's door, claiming they were FBI agents conducting a drug raid. And they broke in. They got the night clerk. His name's Elva Harper. He was age 64. They got him to go down. Is one of those hotels where you had the outside. And they got him, uh, beat him up a little bit, stole some money, got him to take him down to a room where they could get another car. Well, they knocked on one door. And I think they used the same uh, premise. Hey, this is the FBI. We're here to do a drug raid. And these uh, two guys opened the door. Apparently, they didn't have a car, so they just shot them. Wow. They just sh- shot those two. Now, those two survived. They, I don't know why, but the, those two survived. So they went to the next door. And uh, in that room... So they were just like randomly knocking yeah. on. Well, I think the the uh, and... the two that were wounded may have implied, "Hey, the we we don't have a car. The guy in the next room is the one who drove us here." They were all oh together uh, together okay. construction workers. From, the two that were killed were from Hyden, Kentucky, and they were there in Falmouth for a construction project. But anyway, when they got on the, in the the next room over, and um, in that room they got the car keys for another car, and they shot point blank Elva Harper, David Sizemore, age 26, from Hyden, and Monroe Sizemore, they were brothers, 35, from Hyden. It was described later that they were shot execution style, right in the back of the head. These were some bad guys. Well, I was talking to Ike earlier about just the randomness of this murder. They didn't know each other. It was just, that's what makes it so horrible. It does. And I was thinking about it a few weeks ago that, you know, we've done some podcasts mm-hmm. on various murder cases, uh, yeah. Betty Gail Brown and Mary and Molly. And we mentioned some other famous murder cases, but most of those were not random events. Like I'm, I'm convinced somebody was out to get Betty Gale Brown that night. Don't know who. And the Mary and Molly case was the, the, the three robbers had a specific goal in mind. Uh, we're going to break into the Lexington yeah. country club and yeah. kill whoever we need to kill. So it wasn't as random as this case. And I, I think that was the thing that was just so, I mean, it's heartbreaking regardless, but it could have been if they kidnapped a lady from, Say or school that had that lived on the south end of town. Yeah, it could have happened on the south end of town to a completely different family. Mm-hmm. You know, anybody that could have happened to anybody in Lexington, Kentucky, on that day, or uh, Falmouth for that yeah. matter. So yeah, the randomness uh, is still pretty frustrating. And because it just seems like they did it just because they could. Yeah, I, I thought they had the opportunity yes. and they did it. Uh, you know, they were described as psychopaths. I mean, late, later. How else can you describe that? Yeah, psychopaths and those kind of guys. Like I said, Scott was the ringleader. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seemed like control. It was all about control and covering up your tracks and just being evil. I don't don't know how else to say it. I know it happened almost 50 years ago. They committed the crimes in Falmouth by killing the three men in their hotel room execution style. And then they just took off again. They, they took off. They left the Barnes car because when they left the Barnes house, mm-hmm. 
they drove Mr. Barnes's, they took Mr. Barnes's car. So at that time, after they committed the murders, before they committed the murders in Fountain, they decided they needed to change up cars. So they left Mr. Barnes's car at the motel and took off in one of those men that they murdered's car. And one of the surviving victims from the room next to him called police about 1.15. That's what the speculation is, that they did receive a phone call about 1.15. The Falmouth police received a call of a multiple shooting at the motel. Around, around that time, maybe about a half hour later, a officer by the name of Jack Westwood, who I consider a hero that day because he's the one that put a stop to this nonsense, he was out on patrol and had noticed a speeding car, and he was chasing a speeding car. And about that same time, he got a, a police report, police alert, that there had been a multiple shooting at the hotel in Falmouth. So he was following this car, and the car pulled over. And at this time, Westwood, Officer Westwood, kind of knew he was dealing with some potential murderers. And he called for backup, and he he did not go up to the car. He stayed behind his his car's door and, I guess, pointed his weapon and told him to get out, hands up, blah, blah, blah. And so he, he, he was using extra caution because he knew Scott and Sloan were probable suspects, yeah. And he was really surprised that they surrendered without incident especially since one of them had nothing to lose. Later on, Scott was quoted. They asked him, were you prepared to kill that police officer that arrested you? And he said, yeah, but he didn't play fair. He didn't come up to the car. So they were prepared to shoot him in cold blood like he did the other victims. But this officer kept his distance. And then anyway, they were arrested and they were taken, I think, to the Campbell County officials courthouse or jail or whatever, and they confessed to killing the, the victims at motel, Fisher's Motel. And then they said something to the officials that really got them horrified. You may want to check a house in Lexington off New Circle Road. That was the first inkling that anything happened at the Barnes home on Russell Cave Road. Otherwise, nobody knew at all at that because time, it was so late in the day. Yeah, Mrs. Barnes had tried to call her husband that night to wish him an early happy birthday, mm-hmm. but nobody answered. I guess she just figured they were out doing yeah, something. Sleeping. Yeah, but that was the first inkling that something bad happened in Lexington. And they found Mr. Barnes' stolen car at the motel and traced the license number and sent police officers to the Barnes home. And this was uh, noted at 3.58 a.m. Tuesday morning, about 10 hours after the escape, approximately. Well, anyway, the Metro Police entered the home at that time. The car that they had stolen was found behind the house, and what they found inside was pure horror. Veteran police paled when asked by newsmen at the scene what they had found. One police officer called it the most gruesome murder scene he had ever seen. Uh, Several young police officers became ill after viewing the scene. The Commonwealth's attorney, and keep in mind that just the previous year, Furman versus Georgia, the Supreme Court had overruled the death penalty. So there was no death penalty in play at this time. Of course, that would change in a couple of years. But at this time, there was no capital punishment uh, on the table. But the Commonwealth's attorney went into that home, came out, and he was quoted as saying he wished the Supreme Court could have been inside that home. Uh, People who do things like this don't deserve to live. Another reported comment was by Coroner Chester Hager, who described the murders as the worst I've ever seen. A deputy coroner was a little bit more blunt. People who do things like this don't deserve to live. Those who want to do away with the death penalty should have seen this. You know, I actually, years ago, several years ago, maybe 10 to 15, we had a security officer here. I found out he was on the Lexington Police Department before, and he had actually been at the Barnes home that day. And he was, a, at the time, he was a cadet. And he described that uh, 
I don't know if he, he went inside the home, but I think the cadets, and there's a, actually a picture in the newspaper about that, about this. The cadets were outside the house just walking the grounds mm-hmm. looking for any kind of evidence they could find. But uh, he kind of agreed this is the worst. The worst of the worst. Yes. Like I said, the, the death penalty was not in play at this time. They would have got the death penalty, in my opinion. When they were arrested, how long was it before? Did they actually have a court? or? Well, they had a court appearance pretty quick, you know, within yeah. a few days. And they, they were originally put in the Pendleton County Jail, and then they uh, were brought to Lexington uh, Court to face, you know, to a preliminary hearing. And I guess to set a trial date and all. And, and apparently at the Pendleton County Jail, when they were brought out, there's a picture in the newspaper, too, of them carrying Scott out because apparently he did some damage to his ankle when he jumped and claimed he could walk. So they have a picture of both Sloan and Scott being taken out of the Pendleton County Jail. Apparently there was a huge crowd, including... Elva Harper, the motel clerk's sons, were there. One of them described it as as it was a, a powder keg and anything could have ignited it, especially if the two sons decided, hey, you know, yeah. let's get some vengeance right now. I mean, this was a horrible crime. There's no and, and, and people were devastated by it, not only people here in Lexington, but the people in Falmouth. And, you know, and it garnered mo- national attention. Yes, uh, Walter Cronkite had it on the, uh, you know, back in those days, you didn't have the Internet, you didn't have CNN, Fox News, all that. You basically got your news from either top of the hour radio or you turned tuned in Walter Cronkite or Huntley and Brinkley at, what, 630? <laughs> and it was, a, it was a story, you know, when Walter Cronkite tells you something happened, it happened. Okay. Yeah, it's and it's huge, and but both of them were eventually charged with the countless crimes in both Lexington and Falmouth. Now Scott would not live to face trials on his latest crimes. He set fire to his cot. Uh, they eventually took him to Eddyville as a awaited trial. He set fire to his cot and died four days later. He set his own mattress. He on set fire. his. He set his uh, apparently a suicide attempt. Apparently he he com- tried suicide attempts. I don't know if it was to just get attention, but and I think I read a, a statement from a newspaper article or internet. And of course, you don't know how reliable it is. Is he was just trying to grab somebody's attention, but he burned himself up basically. So were they meant to stand trial here in Lexington or both? Or both. both? They oh, were so going to stand. Yeah, trials. two separate entities, okay. two separate court cases. Uh, Sloan went on trial in uh, April of 1974. Now, prior to that, like I said, this, this, this crime was just so devastating and emotions were running high. Kentucky state legislators were pounding the table saying, hey, let's put a capital punishment uh, bill on the table or we can get capital punishment back in, in Kentucky. Polls were taken from community members. People were outraged by this. and So it was a catalyst to bring it back, bring back capital punishment. Well, the Supreme Court ruled like a year or two later that the Furman versus Georgia case had been rectified or whatever. And, but at that time, I think states could set their own. Oh, okay. Is that how you understand it? Yes, right. states could set your own. And there was a, a clamoring, you know, do you want to go there? Do you want to go there, Wayne? <laughs> well, I kind of... Uh, it's up to you now how we are on the podcast. <laughs> Say whatever you want. <laughs> well, my, feel, my feeling is that people are entitled to their opinions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm respectful of everybody's opinion. But when you're facing what those victims face that day, very same people making all these claims about, I'll do this, I'll do that. They're nowhere to be found. Yeah. Okay? It's you versus... The murderer. The murderer. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. That you got to do. I know police do their best, but they can't. They can't get there before the crimes committed. So that's always been my saying: is uh, people are nowhere to be found in these kind of situations. I don't expect them to be because only the murderers have control. So anyway, that's just my personal opinion. So anyway, Sloan 
was convicted on all the, he was charged with like 10 things here and for the Lexington crimes. And he received life, life in prison for a bunch of them, but he received life with no possibility of parole for the rape and murder of Francine Barnes. So he's currently serving his term in Eddyville with no chance for parole. To this day? To this day. So he's... Yeah, you said he was fairly young when he committed he the crime. He was 24. 24? And he, you know, the thing about that is Scott, like I mentioned, had everything, had nothing to lose. He, he was serving life for the, the kidnapping and rape the year before. Sloan was just in there for uh, transporting a stolen car across state lines or something. So... But uh, he saw his chance to escape and commit the crimes, and he's doing the time, and just the way it is. Living with the life choices he made. Yes. Now, the funeral for the Barnes family took place the following Friday, October 5th. And I j- I'm just going to read you a little excerpt from the newspaper about the, the funeral. Uh, more than 700 persons attended the funeral services yesterday for the Reverend John K. Barnes, and his two teenage children at Christ the Church Episcopal on Market Street. Three hearses led a procession of more than 150 automobiles to the uh, 15 miles from the Christ Church to the cemetery at St. Hubert's, Reverend Barnes's church. The small limestone rock church where the Reverend Mr. Barnes had been minister since its dedication on Easter Sunday, 1969, is located on Grimes Mill Road, just inside of Clark County. A relatively new cemetery, there had only been one burial there before the Barnes burial. And they described uh, the three identical birch coffins, and they were buried several hundred feet east of the church on a gentle sloping hill above a small playground. Mrs. Barnes, this is on a Friday, Mrs. Barnes was at her usual place at church that Sunday morning. Wow. So she, she was... I'm going to go on. Now, as I was telling Ike, I would found a picture several years ago in the Herald Leader. I was just scanning the Herald Leader for something. I don't know what. And there was a picture uh, from the March 29th, 1970 newspaper of Francine and John at a unveiling of a portrait that their mother had donated to the Trancy Library. And there's a picture of both of them looking up at the portrait. Their great great grandfather was Samuel Woodson Price. You know the famous portrait of King Solomon. Yeah. Mr. Price painted that. Wow. He was the great great grandfather of the Barnes children. And there's a very haunting picture in the newspaper that two kids looking up at the portrait, and and I, it caught my attention. I just looked at it, and it just it haunts you to look at that picture, knowing what. Would face them would face several them years later. Three, three years later. And Ike brought in a yearbook from 1974, which we mentioned Francine was on the staff of the yearbook at Sayer. And there was a dedication. The, the yearbook was dedicated to the Barnes family, Mr. Mr. Barnes and Francine and John. And there was a dedication note in the yearbook. And I, I'm just going to read it to you here. We're not quite sure who wrote it. The Barnes were important to me. The Barnes were important to this school. I say the Barnes because the Reverend John Barnes, Francine, and Johnny had something important together. In a time when the values of giving your all and playing it by the rules seemed to be missing in so many adults and children, they believed in these values and lived by them. In this book, we have talked about what Sayer is. The Barnes represented the best of what we want to be. Hardly a day went by when they were here that I did not see them. Hardly a day goes by now that I do not remember them and what they stood for. I know that I speak for all of us. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you again for the research that you did. I know these true crime podcasts can be a little rough to cover, but your research is always so thorough and to the point. And make the, the victim's memory be alive again. And, and I think that's that's part of the intention of this podcast. So a lot, thank you so much. You know, a lot of people here in Lexington today, they're unaware of, of this tragedy. And I think it's important to remind people of there, there was a family, there was a Barnes family, and they're very good people. I think it's important to, to relay that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wayne. Yep, you're welcome. 
Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at lexpublib.org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.